1977 Sony KV-1541R Vintage Color Trinitron 1976-1977 uh, Remote Set This is probably a little bit rare Ooh, Luma Sponder Let's see So there's our control panel. Solid state Econo Quick. Uh, issue is no high voltage. Let's get into it. Wonder if that's Energy Star compliant. Drawing two watts just on standby. Okay, here we go. Wow, the hum is interesting. Only 10 watts and dropping. Huh. Yeah, the hum is, you know, when I hear hum like that, I think of something shorted or overloading. <laughs> But only 10 watts, it's nothing shorted or overloaded. Let's see, this is... I gotta push the volume buttons, just, you know, just to make sure the Luma Sponder is Luma Sponding. Look at the inside. It's very clean. Got the service data here, April 77. Check out the little magnets to dial the convergence in. Wonder how good that double stick tape is good for. I love it when I get these comments of people asking me, oh, my TV does this. What could be wrong with it? Do you actually watch my videos? Do you watch how and actually process how complex the diagnostic process is and how complex one of these televisions is and you expect to throw a few words out there a paragraph on a form or a comment and get an accurate diagnosis come on come on man where's my brain medication well, looks like Looks like this one got used quite a bit. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, my TV does this. What's wrong with it? All right, let's see how this thing works. Look at the symbol for the horizontal out. What is that thing? This, this era is not my forte. I, I am much better at the earlier solid state stuff, say pre-74, but we have the diagnostic skills, instruments, and documentation here to fix anything. So let's see, where's the power supply? This separate sheet is the power supply. Well, this is the AC line coming in right here so these are your off the line voltages and then this down here is the flyback and they're getting a lot of the voltages off the flyback as how most sets from this era on out were so let's see let's have a look here should probably start by checking these, although I have a feeling that the issue is going to be in the horizontal output. 
Okay, the reason we have audio is you can see supply number one for the audio output comes directly off the line. So we should probably start by checking these voltages here. Magnet. So let me get set up and we'll start by checking the voltages here. And then if those voltages are not there, then we get into this setup, which includes this lovely whatever that thing is, which I'm just suspicious of that because it's by whatever. Okay, here's that. I believe that's a triac, actually, because it's got anode, cathode, and gate, and I'm on the anode, and I have 164 volts, which is kind of kind of high, and that's why the thing might be humming because there's no load on the uh, regulator. This thing has a fail-safe circuit, and I'm not quite sure what the purpose of this is. I'm wondering if the voltage regulator was too short and the voltage would be too high that this would shut it down. So, uh, yeah, this is where these things can get complex and confusing. I'm going to use a variac and I'm going to come way down on the line voltage. So there I'm at 114 volts at about 85 in. If I go up to 110, uh, we go up to 157 and I get the humming from the speaker. So I'm going to come down to 119. That's on the regulator. I don't know if the regulator is not regulating because there's no load on it, or I don't know if the thing is an auto shutdown because the regulator is bad. So this kind of goes around that. I am looking right there for AC from the horizontal driver and I got basically that. So let's start checking voltages here on a Q512. So you should have 113 on the collector, uh, 9.64 on the base. Interesting, we have, uh, and I'm on, I'm sorry, Q521, which is the horizontal driver. I have nothing on the collector. I'm on Q521 collector, right? I have nothing. So let's see, it gets its 39 ohm resistor through a 25 ohm uh, horizontal driver transformer. Let's just work our way back here if we can. So here's the transformer, horizontal driver. Let's go here. We have zero. Okay, R five twenty two. Okay, R five twenty four looks like it's open. R five twenty four. We have one hundred nineteen volts on one side of it, and zero on the other. Okay, so on this side of it, which goes up to the driver transformer. We have zero volts. If we go down here to this side of it, we have 119. So that resistor is open. Now, why is that resistor open? Where's my flashlight? Okay, that is that 39 ohm orange, white, black. Is it burnt in the middle? It does look like it's a little bit burnt. 
that is a fusible resistor but why is it open um, generally resistors don't just go open they can uh, Generally, when we deal with resistors, we're dealing with old carbon resistors and tube equipment that just drift. But on stuff like this, these metal film or metal oxide or whatever these are, they usually don't just go open. So, why is this resistor open? Well, if this transistor was shorted... get a pointer here so let's see where can this well see this is let's, uh, let me unfold this Let's see, what does this do? This supplies power. It's blocked there. It's blocked here. It should be blocked here unless this is shorted. So we have a 10 microfarad that could be shorted. We could, this transistor could be shorted, but where is the ground reference? comes back through this these things are so complicated <laughs> Where is the ground reference here? Is it through here? What what the hell? Usually the emitter would be pulled to ground. Let me look at this. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pull this transistor and test it and then maybe pull these capacitors and test them. I'm not seeing these circuits are so complicated that uh, I'm really not seeing the ground reference. And there's not a whole lot of current going through here because you're only going from 115 to 113 through whatever this is, 60 something ohms. So this is filled with the Matsushita caps that uh, Jordan Peer loves so much. He says they pee all over themselves when they get old. Um, and his thing is just replace them. So I'm thinking this is one of those cases where the set, I'm repairing the set for somebody and they don't really want that to spend the money to just replace them. So what I'm thinking is, yeah, I'm going to yank, I'm going to yank them in the transistor and we'll see how it goes. I want to inspect them. This is the driver transistor and the winner is, well, it's a, still a transistor. That's good. Let's take some of the caps out. It has not soiled its depends yet. Six microfarads at 1.6 ohms, I would not consider that even out of tolerance. This one here, see the crust? This one here appears that it has started to leak. So, good old J.P. Dillon is right. Although it doesn't test bad, 
that doesn't mean it didn't short or that it's not shorting at a higher voltage and the ESR is a little bit high and yes you can see the crust on the board see the crust on the negative which is the bottom now this appears that this is glue checks okay but I guess that's a relative assumption alright these two parts have been replaced um, that, that tin is that one right there so I guess maybe if that was leaky anyway I'm measuring the voltage from basically from here to ground so it should be 115 I'm at 100 volts on the Variac. Here we go. Let's see what happens. Uh, 135. So the t it did not work. It did not start. Maybe that's too low a voltage. Actually, when I turned it off I heard the squeal of the horizontal output so here we go I went up 10 volts on the Variac but we're still way too high here 152 but listen when I turn it off okay so I'm starting to think the reason why this resistor went open is because it's not loading it down and the voltage is too high because there's like 150 something volts uh, without the load so okay that was I have a feeling this was the result of something else. So great. I was hoping we would just power up and work, but eh, dreams don't come true, I guess. The complexity. Now I have 14 volts AC coming out of the uh, driver transformer going into this. So is this bad? So I got 14 volts AC on the gate of this. Peak to peak is supposed to be 15 volts. And I got plenty of voltage on the anode. I got 126 on the anode. Not looking good for that thing right there. So it's really looking like this is bad. And as a result of this being bad, there was no load applied to the low voltage power supply. So the low voltage power supply spiked and burned out this. So um, I have a feeling that's not a cheap part. Q911 is a... Uh, ECG 276 I probably have that um, I think the next thing we do is we take the horizontal output tester to this and see make sure there's nothing shorted um, loading that down because I don't think that should fail I know this is not a transistor or an e a FET but I got them connected to the you know the same leads so I'm not quite I've never actually used this on solid state let's see horizontal output uh, TV enter DC short DC short. I don't know if you can hear that squealing. Now I'm just driving the flyback. Almost like there's something wrong. 
but it's hard to tell because there's so much load on everything. I reversed the leads and I'm driving it the other way and this seems a little bit better 50 milliamps with the yellow on the uh, collector and if I pull this board off of here it drops so that because that because the flyback is powering the the filament what I'm trying to do here is prove that if I replace this part that it's not just going to get blown apart again. Um, these are expensive parts and if there's some other little 20 cent capacitor causing that thing to fail, uh, that's a real heartache when you put a $25 transistor in something and it immediately pops when you push the power button. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put a light bulb from A to ground. This is 820 milliamps, which is quite a bit. That's like 82 watts. And I want to see if the regulator works, the B plus regulator, because if the regulator transistor was shorted, uh, it could just be putting 160 volts on the whole system. And that would cause everything to fail. Okay, we got a 68 watt light bulb here that should be about 800 milliamps or close to it. Just going from the anode to ground. This is a little bit gutsy, but here we go. I wonder why we get so much hum from the speaker. So let's see if this is actually regulating. I'm going to turn the variac up. Surely does not look like it, does it? Holy crap. At 120 volts, I'm getting 144. Uh, it's just one cascading thing after another. The regulator shorts blows this transistor up. This transistor goes open, the, the voltage goes sky high, burns up the resistor. Uh, it sure does not appear that it's regulating here because that is 90 volts. That is 110 volts. That is 120 volts. That is 130 volts. So this, this regulating circuit, the regulator circuit's not working. One thing after another. So, yes, the low voltage regulator is shorted. Dead shorted. So, we're working our way backwards, unfortunately. This, the chain of events, if you haven't picked it up already, this shorted drove the B plus voltage way up, caused this to blow open. I hope it didn't damage anything else because this blew open the high B plus caused that resistor to fry. So now we can't go back any further. Maybe they connected it to 220. So this is where your line comes in right here. That's your thing that plugs in the outlet. Comes in here. Here's your rectifier. Um, where is the filter capacitor? Well, no wonder why it's humming. The f I guess the regulator works kind of as a filter, too. Where is the filter capacitor? Four seventy. That's an interesting place to put your filter capacitor. So no wonder why it's humming. So you can see here it's supposed to have 144 volts there and a regulated 115 coming out. Well, it's not regulating. We're just getting the 144 coming out of it. So it's shorted. So I'm going to just stop right here. I'm going to pick up the 11 volt Zener diode. I'm going to pick up this transistor, this transistor, and that transistor. This thing is going to be so full of aftermarket parts, it's going to... I think it was an, a recipient of a organ donor.
I don't like using aftermarket parts. I don't like using NTE. The stuff is not as good as Sony factory original parts, but at this day and age, you don't have a choice. So I got to find these other, we'll have to pull all of this stuff out. And it is very possible that this was spiked with too much voltage because of where it's used. I'll just say that. I want to demonstrate something here about NTE. So this is the vertical output to a C1670. It's, they call it ECG 293. And that's 1675 to 93. Now look right above it. 1670, 190. Again, 1670, 190. I was looking through my stash of transistors that I got out of a TV shop that closed down and they serviced a lot of Sony stuff and I found five of the 2SC876 that's the regulator that shorted and I found one of the SG613 now this is a different number than the SG triac thyrist or whatever this thing is that's in the set but I thought we would just test them with the M tester here and see how they look. I checked them uh, with diode check real quick and none of them are shorted. Okay, this is the first one. The beta is 34. This is the next one. The beta is 69. I wouldn't trust the cheap Chinese M tester. I'd trust the transistors. The third one, the beta is 49. The fourth one, the beta is 45. And the fifth one, the beta, is 74. Now, here's the interesting thing. It identifies this thyristor as an NPN transistor with a beta of 1. We know that's not what this is. This is something else. I flipped it around, and the same thing, it's identifying it as a NPN transistor with a beta of 1. We know it's an SCR or something else like that, uh, TRIAC. Okay, here's a different M tester. Same thing, NPN. Jeez, got rickets today. Look at that. Shake O Matic, man. It's kind of cool. Need to get some music going along that goes with that vibration. So, anyway, yeah, this is a different M tester. And same thing, HFE, gain of 1. So it's not set up to identify such a complex, elite uh, piece of silicon gear. We now have a benchmark and some knowledge as to what these test like on the M-Tester. So I'm going to pick up the NTE equivalents and um, we'll pull the ones that are in the set out and see how they test compared to these. You can tell these get sold a lot. $21.95. Yeah, these are not... I need to go back and revisit because these are not... No. That package... The 293 and 294 for sure, and this one for sure, but these two are not, not right. I dug this old power stat up, and I um, wonder if it works. Let me get a male plug on it, and we'll see if this works. Wow, so I stripped this back and the uh, wires just turning to powder. The insulation on the inner wires is just gone. And you know what? 
All right, well, it didn't explode when I plugged that in, so let's see. Oh, there we go. Okay, happiness. So we have a nice working power stat here. Let's get back to the Sony. Back on the Sony with the shorted power supply and other damaged circuits. Let's move into a little nerdgasm territory here and talk transistor substitution and replacements. We have, for sources, we have the NTE book and also the NTE online cross-reference. We have the SAMS parts list and cross-reference to NTE parts. And then we have Transistor Digest. The problem I'm running into, which it, this gets really confusing... Let's just take let's just take 2SC 1670. There might be 10 of them in this set in different parts of the set. The SAMS parts list cross reference will recommend five different NTE parts for each one of those 2SC 1670s depending on the circuit placement. The NTE book and online cross-reference will recommend one for all ten of them. And Transistors Digest, we're going to dig into this right now. We don't... These are actually the real numbers. We're going to dig into this and we're going to take a look at this regulator transistor that I got the NTE replacement for. We're going to see what Transistors Digest says versus what NTE gave me. This transistor right here, which is the regulator output, I guess you'd call it, is a 2SC867. This is what both the NTE book online cross-reference and the SAMS parts list cross-reference give me this transistor to replace that transistor. And you might just say, well, why don't you just use one of the good used ones you have? Well, you know, in general, when you're repairing a customer's whatever, you don't put used parts in it. And that would kind of kill the training aspect of this video. Because if anyone else is following along, trying to fix and diagnose and learn how to work on their old Sony, then they don't have five good used ones. So just scrap that idea. So anyway, TPNP, high voltage audio output. So this is basically the same transistor that you would use in a AM, a line driven AM radio for the audio output. Collector current is one amp and I, I was looking at that and I was thinking well you know that's almost the collector current of this the collector current of this is is almost the full current draw. Well, this is 580 milliamps. So let's look up and see if it's in the book. 2SC 867. Let's look it up in here. This might not cover Sony transistors, but th this would give us the actual real specs on that part. So, unfortunately, this does not cover Sony transistors, and it just skips right over that number. So, Sony made their own stuff. So, Transistors Digest is out of the picture. How about Google.Digest? AllDataSheet.com. There's only one listing for that on here. And 400 volt, 150 volt collector current 1 amp so 23 watts so let's see what we got here 500 volt uh, 1 amp 40 watts so th this one was what 25 watts so this is probably NTE's suitable replacement for that let's put it in there I also got to test um, I got to test everything behind it I got to test that one that one and the Zener diode so we want to pull Q602 which is down here in the corner so this 
board has to come off. So that right there, that transistor is the regulator driver. And then over here, you see there's the voltage adjustment pot. So the Zener diode is that glass thing right below it. And that right there is the other. So we want to test all of these parts. Um, this thing was about 30 bucks. And the doctor says... You are negative. Go out and parte. And here's our pre driver. This is a 2SC926. And uh, some of these were problematic. They would be intermittently noisy. Maybe I better check on that. Okay, so everything looks good back here, and I picked Jordan's brain, who works on this stuff professionally, and he says, 2SC945 is one of the problematic ones, not 2SC926. So, I'm, I'm wondering, wonder this capacitor here, 470, and this 10, are both rolled together into this big black one. I wonder if that sucker was shorted. The TV had sat for 30 years and that sucker needed to be reformed. And when they turned it on, it cremated this regulator. Um, I'm gonna change out the regulator and let's see how it operates. So I'm gonna guess that brown is the emitter because it's the bigger wire and base is yellow and it looks like my guess would be correct no thermal compound for sony that stuff's too good and look at this nte is taken to laser engraving me do good job me use dow 340 silicone zinc heat sink compound me do good work Okay, the damn thing says a slight modification might be needed. Um, this does not fit through this. This does not fit over this because this is the collector connection. And I already cut the collector pin off of the transistor. Yeah, you know what? Don't try this at home unless you have a lot of patience and uh, tools and mechanical skills. Because this, this thing was a little bitch. Um, I had to drill the transistor mounting hole out. Because I'm trying not to modify the original hardware and I moved the, the uh, plate to the bottom. So I think that should work as long as it doesn't hit on this other board all right well it's back in there as tacky as it is it should be both thermally and electrically legit and we got enough space here where nothing's going to touch anything else so yeah slight modification anyway let's see if it regulates uh, first let's see how the old regulator checks Checks is basically shorted. Two resistors. We still know this is bad, but we're looking for some regulation, you know, uh, before we. So I'm on, eh, we'll go to 85 volts. See if it still hums. Okay, let's try that again. Maybe if I plug it in, it'll work. Ooh, no humming. From the speaker so okay let me see if I can do get this all in there's the regulation point see that 
So from a hundred and Okay, it starts to regulate at 114. It starts to regulate at 114 at 110 volts. See that? The regulator is regulating now. As you saw before with that transistor shorted, it would just go up through the roof. And that's what I'm assuming fried this and that there. Now, there could still be a problem with the flyback. Uh, high voltage, when I replace this, it might overload that regulator. and So, we don't know. We're just taking this one step at a time. But yeah, that looks really good. I'm going to see how hot this gets. Uh, it's getting warm. Okay, this thing is called silicon gate controlled switch gate turn off thyristor. And I was thinking about this when we checked the other one I had. This is an expensive part, by the way. Uh, this probably would be just a, like a unity gain type thing where the gain is just one. It's just a switch. Okay, so this one tests, this is the NTE, this one tests the same. NPN transistor with a gain of one. So the other one was good. So this thing, the transistor is getting pretty hot. and But it is conducting heat to the aluminum. I can, I can feel the aluminum getting pretty warm. But I might have a pretty heavy load on it. This is, uh, we'll see. Yeah, let's see how this one tests. This is the one out of the set. Yeah, that's what I would figure. It's going to test. It's just all blown apart. Yeah. The new horizontal out thyristor is installed. Now this is the do or die moment. This is the moment when you press the power button. Because we've done everything we can to kind of confirm that... Uh, it might live but we don't know so we'll, we'll do a hundred volts on the uh, 102 volts on the variac and like I said this you could burn money faster with this than in a fire so here we go God, that's sketchy. The pucker factor on that is is terrifying. Oh, I smell smoke. And there it went. Oh. Fuck. Okay. This was not unexpected. Hey, Still think you can push, post a question in email or on a form or in a comment and get a viable answer? So it looked like it might have popped the fuse, but I saw a flash and some smoke. And I, I wonder, was it that resistor right there? So for the past 30 minutes, I've been, this resistor which was here is in fact blown out. For the fast, past 30 minutes I have been looking for this resistor or this coil, this big coil on this schematic. I can't find it. Here it is right here. So something shorted over here on whatever this goes to but why would that have not shorted why would that short have not been there when I was running it with the light bulb on it because this was all hot with the light bulb on it 
this was not because this this section here is from the flyback so when I had the bad output transistor but I had the regulation circuit working we should have had voltage here so why would that fry all of a sudden with the high voltage working so that point there 162 and it burned up that resistor through this 0 .0068 capacitor. So it was flowing enough current through this capacitor. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not quite sure what this does, what this circuit does. And just checking the horizontal output, $30 part, shorted. Blew it up. I um, think this is a point I walk away. I think this is the point I walk away. And it shorted the regulator transistor again. So this is the point where I say no more. You know, sometimes it's okay to just bail out on something and say, I can't fix it. The right parts aren't available. It could be the flyback is shorted. I never did see any light on the screen, so I'll, and I didn't hear high voltage. So I just assumed it was working because we had static from the audio, which would indicate that the secondary of this is working. But... Yeah, uh, I think this is probably going to be my first video I ever released that was a repair attempt that I walked away from. This really takes me back to working on these things in the, uh, the um, early 90s where, you know, at that time... $30 was a lot of money for a transistor. Now it's, you know, nothing. Um, but, you know, you put a, a new horizontal output in something, and when the, high, when the flyback gets to potential, it shorts, it starts arcing and blows the transistor up. You, you just walk away from it. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. $50 worth of parts every time you want to try and see if you got it fixed? I don't think so. Continuing on with the Trinitron 1541R that uh, did exactly what I thought it might do and uh, had me say a few choice words. I've been working on this and let me just say to start off I'm not giving up. Um, we are going to destroy a lots more parts attempting to fix this. So I pulled the board out and I ordered a bunch of stuff to attempt to fix this. The owner um, understands how these sets can be and he wants it fixed. And he said, let's keep going on it. And I, you know, explained that I was a little bit discouraged at what happened, which I did a bunch bunch of research on the web and it turns out that this is a very common thing for this to do. In fact, a lot of people say when it blows the horizontal output, walk away from it. Uh, but I'm not going to do that. So, um, here's looking at this, kind of what happened. And I've, I've started to you know, dig into this. This is the low voltage power supply right here. So this is coming in, this is the transistor we replaced. And there was an NTE part for this and I discovered on um, DigiKey that you can kind of match parts that they sell. And it turns out that it's the same as a uh, TIP50 Look at this, so NTE-198. This is the DigiKey online thing. It's basically the same as TIP-50. Well, look, at, look at the price of TIP-50. 234 for the NTE, 84 cents. 
and uh, 78 cents. And look at the specs are all exactly the same. One amp, 400 volts. One volt, 200 milliamps. Look at this, same thing for that regulator transistor. 78 cents. So we can blow a lot of these up and not get frustrated. So the resistor that smoked, this 39 ohm, one watt right here, which is in series with this 0.0068, uh, that is this resistor right here. I took it out. It was, it was right right here I think I just stuck it on the back yeah I did just as a placeholder so anyway we ordered um, new ones of those so we have new 39 ohm resistors this you have to look at what fried right so 162 and then you have this, this is a tuning circuit for the flyback. Think of this like horizontal efficiency in an old TV. So 162 feeds in right here. So that is the source to the anode of the SCR. The only way trying to simplify this the only way this resistor could burn is if this circuit was so out of tune that it was forcing so much AC back up through here that it developed a high AC voltage across here that fed through the capacitor because remember the capacitor will block direct current so the only way this can get hurt is if there's a bunch of AC here or I guess in a really random world if this was to go open and this was to short but that's not what happened something here is so out of tune that the AC was not the flyback was not tuned properly to absorb the AC so it pushed the AC back up through here trying to uh, simplify this anyway the damper diodes I guess can be a problem and doing a bunch of research on DigiKey this is a 1.5 kilovolt 10 amp they call it general purpose, but in the spec sheet for this, it calls it a damper diode. And it's a TO220 package, so it's not the same as... Okay, so we're going to have to deal with that. It's not the, This is the damper diode in the set. The other thing I read that can cause this, which is very possible, that would cause this to be way out of tune, is the capacitors. Of course the flyback could cause it, but what's not going to cause this to burn is if something gets screwed up back here and then that shorts. That's not going to cause that to burn because the moment this shorted there would be no AC here to get through this capacitor to burn the resistor. So the, the issue really has to be I'm going to say right here or with the yoke, there's some kind of tuning issue here. So I ordered these 330 picofarad capacitors. Uh, there's a few of them here, but I think the main one is right there and right there. And these kind of control the high voltage. So I got... 330 kilovolt um, 2 kilovolt capacitors 
Thank you very much, China. Like 30 cents a piece. I also picked up this guy. There are four original Sonys, and here are five NTE. If you buy NTE parts off of DigiKey, you get them directly from NTE. They're about half the price of what they are in the local store. So, also, let's see, what else did I get here? This is some general purpose diodes. Oh, by the way, these are high frequency diodes. These are, these are high frequency diodes, too. And what is this? This is, oh, I thought this might be neat to try. I didn't, I didn't know if this SCR and these SCRs were the same. Um, 1.2 kilovolt, 79 amp. You know, let's, let's see it burn this thing up. I think it would probably burn the transformer on the pole outside feeding the house up before it burned that SCR up. The TV would be a raging fire before that thing died. Anyway, so this is that coil that that resistor and capacitor are in parallel with. See, I pulled this off kind of to inspect it. It's not that big of a deal. So we have a couple capacitors of issue, of course, this one, this one, um, this one, and that one. Any of these high voltage disk capacitors could be a problem. This is the boost um, rectifier. And yeah, that if that was screwed up, that could definitely cause a problem. Anything off of this line, which includes the yoke, can cause a weird tuning issue, cause this to fail, and cause that resistor to burn. So I'm thinking what I might want to do is just leave it the way it is and try and use a Syncord to further diagnose it. I might want to put this resistor in, uh, maybe check this capacitor, and uh, let me do some of that and I'll get back to you. I looked at all the electrolytics, and there really are no electrolytics that could cause what we saw here. There's none in the circuit at all. It's going to be a disc or, or a diode or something. Maybe the flyback is twacked. Also, I got a whole nother TV from the gentleman to, to, that's got a video problem, but the high voltage works to compare. Well, this is interesting. I'm measuring the boost diode, and it measures uh, 900 millivolts one way and nothing the other. I'm just going to check a few of these capacitors. This machine does not check these with high voltage pulses, but I'm going to assume that, you know, if they're measuring pretty close that they're not damaged. I took this 330 out and tested it and it checks good but it's got this freaking glue all over the all over the pins like this is that glue that becomes conductive. Uh, I, I'm trying to clean this glue off of here. I need to find something heat it it melts but otherwise it is stubborn i'm gonna have to gasoline will take it off maybe so i cleaned that glue up it's this same crap as this except this is all low voltage but apparently this can become conductive now the previous one we took out of here was completely blown open and this one dead shorted and when it did shorted it blew this fuse it blew the regulator it blew a bunch of stuff now somewhere I read that the original OEM Sony parts are fused internally so 
if they go bad, if they short, they blow open internally. Where the NTE, they short, they blow everything else up in the set. And I gotta say, you know, this being a low hour set, I'm really leaning towards one of these diodes, maybe one of the disc capacitors, or possibly the flyback, but we need to do more testing on this. I'm just going through it right now. I put the new resistor in there. I've been checking parts. I checked our regulator driver again. It's good. I might change that fuse. New resistor has been installed. New fuse has been installed. And new horizontal output silicon gate controlled switch has been installed. Now I'm probably... Before I fire it up, I'll probably put the 79 amp one in there to see what happens. And I'm, I'm probably going to dim bulb this thing. You know, even if I do a, a 300 watt lamp, it won't blow that fuse if it shorts. I guess the first thing I should do while it's still apart is change the regulator transistor again. I'm gonna go with a tip 50 this time. Also, I was kind of looking at the circuit again and I want to make one correction to my earlier statement about no electrolytics. I I think it's possible for this one right here. This is a 10 microfarad at 250. And what that does is that that filters, I believe, the screen voltage because I haven't verified this on the schematic, but the orange wire right there comes up to right here and kind of feeds this board. So I think that's like a 192 volt source. So maybe if that capacitor was shorted, it would cause this. There's absolutely no visible. So we're going to check that we're going to use the sin core and we're going to spend some more time with the sin core uh, horizontal output tester set system device microprocessor controlled e-cigarette tobacco nicotine management vape system and we're going to compare it we're going to cheat a little bit we're going to compare it to another one of these TVs that I have that has a video or IF problem, but the high voltage works perfect. Tip 50. Here's a little tip for your tip 50. This is basically the same transistor that's used as an audio output in those line driven uh, clock radios and table radios. Radios like this that use the, uh, I don't know where it is in this one. It's right there. That's basically, you could use a tip 50 for that. The regulator has been replaced for the second time. Actually, changing this is one of the more difficult things because of where it's located. I think I got this all reinstalled properly. And I believe I got this hooked up and I dug out the manual on this which gives a lot of description of horizontal circuits so basically this is how we're gonna hook it up and it's gonna tell us the efficiency of the it's gonna drive the horizontal circuit at 10 percent of what the TV would which should tell us So the efficiency is bad. I forget how it calculates that. It's some looking at the capacitive and inductive something or another. Isn't that a good description? But what I want to do is I want to measure the voltage across that capacitor. 
And here's what it's driving it at. So how do we say yes to this? So measuring across that capacitor, we got 26.2 volts. That seems okay to me. I, I mean, we don't know, maybe it's shorting as the voltage goes up, maybe it's shorting. But what I want to do is connect this to the other TV the same exact way and see what kind of results we get. So appearing here on the dirty green carpet is a in poor condition with no picture but a raster. So this has working high voltage. Uh, this has been dropped a few times, I think. This is a uh, KV1512, which I believe has the same deflection as the set we're working on that's blowing up transistors. So what I'm going to do is start comparing. It's cheating, but who cares at this point? This one seems to have a more modern damper diode. Um, it's got the original Sony transistor. It'd be neat to find one of these that had been repaired and analyze it and copy what was done. Uh, so let me hook the analyzer up to this one and we'll see what we kind of numbers we get. Well, look at this one. 80 milliamps. And this one works. This one's even worse than the other one. So when I crank this all the way up to 150 volts peak to peak, this one I get 36 volts on that capacitor. I get 32 on the other one. This one says DC load, and I hear this one chirping. There's a difference between the two, but it seems like this is the one that would fry stuff. Let me just... Sound like it worked for a second and then it looks like it's got a little bit of a weak CRT. So it's working. I don't know why this one measures more inefficient than the other one. That's bizarre. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to change. And I took that damper diode out. I lifted the damper diode and it didn't make any difference here. So this is not... This is not testing this thing at full high voltage potential. It's just not. It's, you know, if we got a part here that's arcing when it gets up to a thousand volt pulse, this is not going to drive it hard enough. I'm thinking about changing that damper with the new one, maybe the disc capacitors. We'll test the regulator again and make sure I got that fixed. And power it up with the Variac and a light bulb. Let's just test one more thing here, what we got on the boost. We got 118 volts on the boost. This is the one with that weird diode that measured weird. So with this at maximum, 118, 119 volts on the boost. Okay, with this one we got 140 volts on the boost. You could see it jumping around there, and the thing is screaming. Mm, something's different about these. I got the damper installed. And you know, this might just been one of those things where if a shop saw this style of diode, they just changed it. I don't know. Probably not many people alive that would remember that. Uh, anyway, I'm hooked back up. I don't have the horizontal. I'm checking the regulation again. And... Looks like we regulate starting about... About 100 volts. So let's see where the relay disengages here.
let me see this. So the set will turn on and off at 80 volts. Set will turn on and off at 70 volts. Set will not turn on and off at 60 volts. So I say we start it maybe about 75 volts somewhere in there um, we'll run a light bulb let me think about this this is the AC horizontal drive into the output transistor and I don't think we want to go much below 85 volts with this because we don't want to underdrive that transistor. I believe that'll damage it. I'm thinking about putting that big that big transistor in there and seeing what it does. Just out of curiosity that 79 amp one. There it is, bodged in there. Here's what it is. No idea. It's for a battery charger for an electric car. Let's see what it does. Oh man, the pucker factor, let me tell you. It's like Russian roulette. So I'm going to go to about 95 volts since I'm isolated through, I think that's a 200. Here goes. go up a little bit more. I don't think there's enough voltage here to hold the relay in once the light bulb. So let's go up a little bit higher. Man that's drawing a hell of a lot of current. Ooh. I think it's something shorted. So that was weird. It clicked on. And then something popped over here and the light bulb came on, but I recycled it and now it's not. Well, I don't know what happened here, but we lost our horizontal drive. Uh, horizontal. I took the big transistor out. We lost, we don't have any uh, waveform now, AC on the gate. wonder what happened. So it was obviously driving this thing, and there was current flowing through it, and then it stopped. That's why the light bulb, so I wonder what happened. Oh, cremated our regulator transistor again. Crap, that, that, that's the worst freaking thing to change on this thing. Now the horizontal driver transistor is shorted, but how? It's isolated behind a transformer. This thing looks like it's shorted too. I replaced the horizontal driver transistor and resistor again with a tip 50 and I have my horizontal drive back. You know, I think the issue here, what I did wrong was the light bulb. I think the light bulb I'm not going to be able to do a dim bulb on this because what happened is is 
when I started it with the dim bulb, there was so much drop across the bulb, the horizontal oscillator circuit didn't start. So, um, I'm going to replace the regulator again. And I think what we'll do is we'll hook this up and look at the waveform going into the horizontal output. Not that that's going to show us much, but maybe it's worth looking at. I'm getting sick of changing that regulator. Here's what the waveform looks like. 13.2 kilohertz, 37 volts peak to peak. Uh, that's what the transistor disconnected, though. Yeah, they want it to look a little bit different here, but I don't know how much of that is due to the transistor being connected or disconnected. Huh. Yeah, that looks a little bit different than uh, what we had here. So I'm cheating a little bit. This is the other set that works. And it looks exactly the same. Like exactly the same. So I've got everything hooked back up here again. And I'm not going to go above 100 volts on the Variac. And I'm going to see what happens here. Uh, it's running at 35 kilohertz? Really? 17 volts? There's no raster and I smell something burning. It is that resistor again. The one in parallel with the... Uh, and this is not getting... Something is way out of tune on this thing. Why is it running at 35 kilohertz? Let's look at the other TV. Okay, here's the other TV that's working, powered up, working right now. It's running at 15.4 kilohertz. Why the hell is the oscillator running like double the speed? No wonder why it's not producing high voltage smoking parts and blowing everything up. So, what, an hour and a half into this, we just finally got to the point where somebody called the Blambu Bants to make the dog bark. Okay, so why is the oscillator running at the right speed in this with the horizontal output transistor disconnected? When you connect it on the high voltage starts, the oscillator speed doubles. Of course the circuit's going to be way out of tune if it's being fed 35 kilohertz. Huh. Time to look at schematic. So this voltage here comes from the flyback. So this would not be present until the circuit starts. So something is happening when this voltage develops here it the oscillator doubles in speed or something like that and maybe I don't like firing this up like this because I think it'll eventually damage it but maybe we should check this voltage and see what it is Maybe one of these electrolytics is open, but I'm pretty sure I checked all of those. I went through and checked all the electrolytics in this. I mean, I could just replace them, but I'm trying to actually find something wrong. And what I did is I re-disconnected the uh, horizontal output. And, of course, the horizontal frequency has come back down to 13 kilohertz. I think what I'm going to manually do, this yellow wire right here is the 
voltage that comes off the flyback. So once the horizontal circuit starts working, it gets its voltage from itself. It becomes a loop. So I'm going to get some batteries and just back feed into that, I think. So watch this. This is 12 volts worth of, uh, 13 volts worth of lithium iron phosphate batteries. I'm going to connect this to the yellow pin one there. Watch what happens here. See if I can get this so it's visible. Let's watch this. That shouldn't do that. Okay, I'm running the same test set up on this. Uh, I got the thing disconnected, the horizontal output. There's our signal. I'm going to connect the battery, watch what happens. It's very bright out here, I apologize, but the frequency The frequency does not change. So something is wrong here on this one. This is very difficult. I pulled this transistor out of here. This is oscillator control Q591. And now it's working right with that transistor out of there. Watch this. The frequency's not changing. What is going on with this circuit? This circuit right here with this transistor out, it works. What is going on here? I think I found it. I think I found it. And I want to just sit here for a second and stew in my depends and enjoy the creamy sensation while it lasts. <sighs> By removing that transistor, it quit misbehaving. That Zener diode right there is leaky. With it out of circuit, it's measuring 1.3 volts. I'm on diode check. It's measuring 1.3 volts one direction. I'm going to flip it. Uh, I'll just flip it around right here. Measuring point the other direction. It should measure about 0 0.6, 0 0.7 one direction and open the other direction until you hit 17 volts. So if that sucker was leaky, it would probably bias this transistor on and cause this circuit to go nerky burfler dir dirgel erval flergel. I got the transistor back in and I have the Zener diode lifted out. Let's see what happens. Power. Okay, there's our hump. Now we're going to connect our battery. Perfect. It's a freaking shorted Zener diode causing all these parts to blow up. Let me take a second and try and explain this if anybody missed what was going on. So, when you initially turn the set on, all you have are these voltages here, okay? This is the flyback right here. So once the horizontal output starts and, you know, it produces a high voltage for the CRT, but also all these low voltages for the rest of the set, well, the oscillator initially starts on this voltage right here. Once it's running, it gets this voltage here off the flyback. So it's a loop. It's using 
voltage that it generates off the flyback fed back into itself. And it uses a bunch of diodes as gates. Well, so three is the voltage off the flyback. So once the horizontal circuit starts, it's getting voltage here. And it's coming over here. Well, the problem is this stupid diode was shunting this off the ground. I believe if, if this line goes over 17 volts, this would start conducting. Well, you know, this is shorted, so it's causing this thing to make the oscillator wig out. But it only makes the oscillator wig out when the voltage is coming in here from the flyback. So that's how I was simulating connecting the batteries to this point. So this point runs the IF and audio and everything too. That's why the, you'd hear the sound come up when I connected the battery. So it was a very interesting problem. And now I understand what was meant by some of the discussion on Video Karma that I found about feeding this feeding this voltage from another source in to check everything but man what a weird problem I maybe I shouldn't get excited yet but I'll pick up that diode tomorrow and we'll see what happens we'll come back to this one and fix this one in a future video I'm in no rush I had just requested it uh, as a test subject to compare. This is going to be a tough one to find. This is the driver transistor. This is not in the NTE. There's no NTE substitute. That's a high voltage transistor. I'm going to have to figure something out. Uh, this is a 2SC1810 driver transistor that got cremated. And NTE has no replacement for it so I'm trying to find something in DigiKey and uh, collector base is 700 collector emitter is 300 and there is basically nothing like this I'm, I'm going through everything in uh, this one is 400 and 700 uh, emitter base 9 volts and let's see what was the other one here emitter base 12 volts so yeah it's getting kind of hard to find but I'm, I'm looking through what digikey has to offer here and it's amazing how cheap transistors have gotten um, it's it's quite quite awesome that they've really gotten so cheap that, I mean, ninety-four cents, a dollar twenty-three. Let's look at this one. Let's see what this one is. Uh, same thing, nine volts. I would like. I would like to be. This one here looked a bit better. Um, Seven hundred, four hundred. I don't know. I'm gonna look through this and find something. Hopefully, this is the last box from DigiKey. This TV is gonna be such a hodgepodge of parts that uh, I hope it's reliable. Um, four hundred volt, four amp transistors. These are to replace the uh, driver that I can't find a cross for. Uh, 400 volt 1.5 amp. I'm actually more inclined to use that one because it had a higher um, emitter to base breakdown, I think. And our 17 volt Zener diodes that are responsible for a month of my suffering and the past hour and a half of your suffering. Just for curiosity's sake, I'm interested in seeing what the peak to peak is with the tip 50 versus this transistor so i'm on 80 volts here because i don't have the light bulb load applied and our peak to peak is uh 
35.3 volts. So I'm going to put this transistor in and we'll see if it changes. It's often a good idea to take a big bright flashlight, you know, and backlight this. So you can make sure you didn't do any solder bridges. Actually, I gotta say, it does not like that transistor. It doesn't appear to. Uh, the peak to peak is lower. And uh, the frequency, I can hear it squealing. I'm gonna try this other one. It doesn't seem to like this one either. 12 kilohertz, 34 volts, but look at the the waveform. I'm going to try the tip 50 again. Or maybe I screwed something else up. Look at the tip 50. It looks very happy with that. But I just don't like the breakdown voltages on the tip 50. They're, they're a few hundred volts lower than the original Sony part. But look at the waveform here. I'm almost tempted to pull that driver out of that other TV and compare it. I borrowed the OEM transistor out of the other set. Let's see what happens here. Okay. Look at the waveform. Uh, 12.3 at 35 volts. It really likes the tip 50, man. The tip 50 really matches. I think we're going to have to go with the tip 50. Because this is one thing that you want right. Even though the tip 50 is not um, the same voltage. Uh, it's going to just have to do. This is the other high voltage transistor, not the tip 50. And the frequency is close. It's a little bit lower, but I'm looking at this slope here. The slope was not nearly as severe with the tip 50 and the OEM transistor. Yeah, I'm just, you know, I'm just wondering. I, I don't want the high voltage of this thing to break it down and kill it. Yeah, you know, the tip 50 was not that high, but I don't know, the waveform sure looked closer. I decided I'm going with the TIP 50. It just performs the happiest and just like uh, the original equipment here. Was this uh, 2SC 1810? So, I mean, these are only like 50 cents a piece, so buying a bunch of them to experiment with is, you know, not a big deal. Uh, if it was, you know, 1985, I'd just call up the parts house and tell them to send me some Sony OEMs. I wouldn't go on eBay and buy counterfeit Sony OEMs that were total junk. So, Zener diode. Let's see what this thing thinks of the Zener diode. It does obviously doesn't think much of it. But if I measure it with the diode check, it measures as a leaky diode in two directions. Okay, here's a new one. It just measures a, as a diode with a, break, a breakdown of 721 millivolts one direction, but it would be 17 volts the other direction. All right, so tip 50's in, Zener diode is in, uh, 5 watt, not that, that was necessary. We have the replacement damper diode, which maybe I should go back to the original, but hey, that's a substitute, that's a substitute, the Zener's a substitute, this is a substitute, and the damper's a substitute. What a bunch of... Anyway, I'm going to go up to about 100 volts here. I think it would kind of start there. And uh, here we go.
We never have mm, something's burning. It's that same resistor capacitor combination down there that's smoking. Why? We're at 14 kilohertz now, but we never have seen a raster on this thing, uh, which is weird. I'm going to power it up again. Oh, it's glowing red. See that? I am clipped across that resistor, and I want to see what the voltage across that resistor looks like in AC. So here we go. Uh, 175 volts peak to peak. 180 volts across a 39 ohm resistor. No wonder it's glowing red. Now I thought that the reason we were getting that voltage on the back side of the flyback across that inductor was due to the frequency being way off. But, uh, man, how many things are wrong with this thing? Like, really, I mean, now we got the frequency on. Frequency's not 35 kilohertz, it's 14.7 as it should be but now it's still and the thing is we've never seen high voltage with this it's never it, it, it doesn't appear that it's developing high voltage but it does de appear that it is developing um, the low voltages because you hear the sound we had this capacitor on the flyback down here and it's still sitting at hundred and four volts. Let me see what well, it seemed like it I feel like it goes up and then it starts coming down. It's kind of weird. This thing has never developed any high voltage at all ever. Yes I realize this is a double connector here. Uh, let's see. Ooh. So it came up for just a second. That is so weird. If I feed it with this thing, 118 milliamps since it's AC load and we see about two volts two kilovolts here and it's crying I can hear it going wah, 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 wah. it's not happy if I go to the other side of this tuning coil like straight to the flyback it does not scream I get 75 milliamps and about 1.5 kilovolts let's compare that to the other one yeah on this one I get Three kilovolts. I wonder if that's adjustable with this. Let me see. No, okay. I get three kilovolts, uh, 48 milliamps on uh, the B plus side, and on the other side, I get 72 milliamps and two kilovolts. So on this one, adding that coil in makes it more efficient where on the set that's troubled, adding that coil in makes it more inefficient. Tuning issue. Where is the tuning issue? Ring testing this, I get 11 rings. Um, this thing is really confusing. I, I notice when I, com I disconnect the flyback, uh, so it's just the flyback without the yoke or anything, and the milliamps and the current, the 
high voltage are the same using this, but the resonant frequency is way different from the other set. The other set is right. This set is way off. You know, one other thing I noticed is that this flyback, the bottom nut is missing. I wonder if someone's been in here before. Okay. Um, would this affect the resonant tuning of the flyback? You can see that originally had a, and it looks like it's just broken off. Would this affect the tuning of the flyback? I know if it was a coil around this way it would, but going around the outside of the core, would it? Yeah, it look like it looks like it failed. I don't think this carries any current though. I don't think this I don't think that affects it. But how do I prove it without taking the one off the other flyback? Okay, this does not appear to affect it at all on or off I wrapped a piece of wire so the going this direction doesn't affect it. I tried changing this electrolytic didn't help of course. Then I disconnected 7 and I disconnected 10 and I lifted uh, this right here which is that. So I've literally got everything disconnected from the secondary of the flyback and it still does the same thing. And I compare the the gate signal to the working TV and they're almost identical. This is Turfon Kirsch Perfel Fluffer Burj Barvalergo Blurver. This board and this board in the working set are exactly the same board. I'm considering switching the whole board. Um, I just, I'm at a complete loss here as to where to go. I, you know, I could swap some parts or I could just swap the whole board and then work backward from there. I'm going to figure this damn thing out. The issue is now we got so many aftermarket parts in this board that, you know, who knows if it's one of them causing the problem. Maybe it doesn't like this NTE horizontal output transistor. So I've literally substituted the parts out of the working TV into this TV. Everything right here except the horizontal output. And yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, don't, I just don't know. I don't see how that could be developing the high voltage, but it's developing it across that coil. I could try subbing that coil out. Okay, well, I think I got some bad news here. And yeah, I guess there was no way to know, but um, the only difference between this board and the, the board that come with the set is this one has a D4 for the remote power to kind of keep this hot all the time, which is just tied across the line. So I put the complete board in here from the working set, complete board. I get the same exact results. I'm just going to do it just for a second here. Same exact results. So it's got to be the flyback. It's got to be because I disconnected the yoke in both sets. The good working set went down to 10 kilovolts from 25. It made no effect on this set. So the only thing that's similar between the two sets is the flyback now. Or I mean different between the two sets. Because I, I disconnected everything off the flyback except just the flyback. So it's got to be the flyback. I guess there's really nothing in here that could cause that. It's got to be in the flyback. Man. Anyway, uh, 
the owner of this is going to bring me another one of these tomorrow another 1541 with a bizarre deflection issue but it has high voltage it's just like a squeezed trapezoidal picture um, so I might just leave this board out maybe I'll stick this board in his the one that works see if it corrects that one's problems and if it works yeah I, I don't see I mean I disconnected everything else here that could possibly cause an issue you know the weird thing about this is <laughs> but we got a load on it I mean I, if I start taking the load off what does it do like this will take the filament that takes the filament off of it and that goes from good to good you know but then we got all the other loads connected to it you know all this over here so I don't know it sure just doesn't seem like the flyback is bad it's really weird I pulled this off which is the main B plus source to all this stuff and it just I it doesn't you know a bad flyback would be drawing a ton of current it would be shorted and it's not it's it's a weird failure for a flyback I'm gonna pull this flyback out of here in anticipation for the set that's coming and I just wanted to note not that anyone's gonna work on one of these but I mentioned earlier I think that this is a coaxial cable and you can see that little spring there that's the uh, horizontal static deflection and you have to make sure that you get that in that hole touching that pin. So I'm going to uh, yank this entire assembly if I can. Okay, here's our Sony 1541 donor set that was just dropped off. And you can actually see the problem with this set with it turned off. The cameras, I don't think, is picking it up as well as you see this here. This is screen burn. So, you see here. So, there was a lack of deflection, or the deflection was running in this trapezoidal uh, pattern. And whoever owned it just kept using it like this for maybe it was a CCTV screen security office you know for security monitor and they just ran it like this but this is not a usable set so with this screen burn the set is basically a part set so what I'm thinking about doing is using the flyback out of this one and the deflection board out of this one in the other one will have to correct this problem Maybe we should correct this first. I can't even imagine how many hours it must take to damage the CRT like that. Wow, that is really bright. It's probably just a capacitor. But the CRT is junk. Okay, the flyback is the same. Um, see if this has got the original. It has the original Sony horizontal output. You could tell this one has some hours on it. Look at how dirty this one is, but you know, it'd have to have hours on it. One difference I see is this board right here and this. I don't know what this is, but I wonder if this board is that on screen. This must be that on-screen display that I saw there. Wow, 1970s on-screen. Talk about cutting edge. So the flyback is the same. This is different. 
that looks that looks homemade or like an add-on what the okay this board has four wires uh, one of them's connected to, I believe this was B plus right here. Um, I think, or is that, I'm not sure what that is. That might be a capacitor in the vertical. Uh, ground, right? That's ground. And then the other two are connected to horizontal size yeah that's supposed to be an inductor there that was removed and this thing was installed I have no idea what's going on with this I mean, is the trapezoid issue caused by this modification, or is there an open capacitor causing it? I don't even know if we're going to try and get into that, because uh, this is unusable anyway with this picture tube. So, back to the other set, I'm going to yank the fly back. You know, so looking at this, I'm starting to wonder if this was maybe used because this is not original this is an add-on I'm starting to wonder if this thing was used in a video game where it was like tilted back at an angle so you needed the trapezoid because you were looking at it as a viewing angle that's just a guess because this thing is I can show you what this is tied into that board is tied into one of these coils which are between the pin cushion and yeah they're in the pin cushion circuit and this is the return to the yoke right here so they're modifying the action the horizontal deflection action of the yoke because this line here goes to the yoke the horizontal of the yoke it almost looks intentional. Okay, I'm going to discharge this. Is this... Doesn't seem like there's anything there, but... This could... Potentially hurt. Okay, here are the two flybacks. This is the one out of the modified set. High hour. And um, this is the one that I think we're having trouble with. I don't know. Uh, a few differences. We have two 10Ks in parallel here, which is what the schematic talks about. We have two 4.7Ks here. The rest of it all looks the same. And this does not look like a modification. Uh, just the way the resistors are both installed with the silver band on top, same thing here. I mean, this this does not look like a modification, and they are the same freaking part. So let's take the tester and do some checking. Okay, let's start with the ring test on the primary. This is the good one out of the working set. 19 rings oh boy here's the one out of the set that was not working 26 rings and just for note we would expect this one to have like two rings that's that's what's weird about this i'm thinking there might be a bunch of uh, turns in parallel and one of them's open in this i don't know this Okay, this is the load test, 17 milliamps, 
50 40 percent it, it moves around the timing moves around see the current draw is about the same this is on the one out of the set that was working and I don't know let me go back to the other one see how much faster faster the right word there's definitely a resonance difference that that's the only difference I'm seeing is that the resonance of this is different than this which would make sense why it's burning that coil capacitor dealy on the input it's very bizarre there's virtually no hardly any very minimal detectable difference between these two flybacks you know I almost think it's not going to fix the set but I'm going to put it in I mean it was just working in this modified trapezoidal dealy scoiler yeah this would be easier done yeah you got to make sure you get that Yeah, I need two hands. The board is back in. This is the board with all the aftermarket parts. Um, new flyback. Flyback's connected. This is a much higher hour flyback than... But anyway, um, you know, I, I just... I can't confirm the other flyback's bad, and I don't see much of a difference between this one and the one I took out that wasn't working so I'm not I don't have high hopes here and at that point I really just don't know what is wrong with this so it seems like if I stay down around 100 volts I don't hurt anything so here goes Ooh, it's the first time I've heard high voltage on it Come on, baby. I heard high voltage. But now, nothing else. Yeah. Definitely high voltage, but where did our sound go? I might have something disconnected. Are the filaments getting hot here? Okay, we're definitely better here. The filaments are glowing. The resistor is not glowing, which is a start in the right direction. But now there's no sound. And yeah, I have no, I think I was supposed to have 16 volts on the yellow wire there and I have minus 0.2. I see what happened. Somehow we got a crack here in the board uh, when I was desoldering it or unwinding the wire wrap. So let me just fix that. I don't know if you can really see that on the camera. Okay, now that that's fixed, we should have our low voltages again. Oh, crap. Okay, we'll turn our brightness down, and we'll turn our screen down. We've been through this before. Uh, so now we have no vertical deflection. Wow, that's bright. It's a screen all the way down, too. Okay, well, if I turn the picture, the brightness, and the screen down, I can control it. It's a little bit red on the low-end tip. So we have no vertical deflection now. Wonder why. I need to replace that resistor that was turning white. 
or red, but okay, the flyback was bad. So before I dive into the vertical issue on this, which we kind of know, you know, now this, this capacitor goes open and blows the transistors out, but um, about this flyback, you know, a lot of times what they'll do is they'll parallel coils like you'll have the primary winding and it'll consist of two strands of wire that are parallel wrapped. The only thing I can think of is with this one in there that broke and I'm tempted to take this board off so we can actually look at and maybe see that. So I desoldered the board and I'll show you what I found. Absolutely nothing. And the why this does not have parallel. It does not look like it has parallel turned coils. So keep in mind here that uh, our primary is our primary is four and six. These are our primaries right here. So B plus is connected to six. The output transistor is connected to four. So you can see on that one there is one. There's a double wire. That bare wire in the center is not used, and six was our B plus, which does not appear to be a double wire. I mean, this thing looks good. I just can't see anything wrong with this. I'm almost tempted to pull the core out of it. See, that's a double wire right there on eight, but that's a center tap. So this is not using parallel coils like a lot of stuff does. I'd like to see if I could get the core out. And of course I tested all tested or substituted all of these parts. So and there's not much and there's no carbon tracking, so this is a real trip. Of course they got the core glued in here and they put the core in there and then drove that shim down in there to keep it from coming out. Just what the hell could be wrong with this thing? Mm. So there's our wedge and I heated the ferrite up with a heat gun and then slowly worked it out. But what's interesting is this has like uh, little insulators to keep to keep it from touching. Yeah, that's pretty thick. Wouldn't it be fantastic if someone was playing a joke and um, they said, well, you know, let's, let's make a classmate diagnose this TV. So they took this apart and put these little things to space the core apart and change the tuning of the flyback. I can't see that. I mean, the TV had to work when it left the factory, and this sure doesn't appear to be tampered with. If this is a, if this is a, uh, a test, this is a really good one. But yeah, I, I didn't know that there should have been these spacers here. I thought you would have wanted it to touch. But maybe it doesn't magnetically, maybe it doesn't affect the magnetic field of it. Uh, hell, I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. So simply put, I don't know what's wrong with this flyback. I don't know. It rings good. It current tests, 
current test draws good. It produces the same amount of high voltage when I use the tester is the good one. I don't see anything wrong with it. I don't know. Very mysterious, but it's bad. Yeah, you know, I just wonder. We all make mistakes, and I don't mind admitting mine. This whole video is filled with the, the elusive trail electronics can lead you down, but I, I wonder if this right here could be causing a problem with the vertical. Wouldn't that be something? Well, there's no more line now. Oh, yes, there is. Well, high hopes. Well, this one is good. Wait, maybe this is the problem. I forgot to plug the vertical part of the yoke back in. That that could cause a problem. Getting sloppy. Getting sloppy on this one, you know? Just getting sloppy. Okay, the plug is the yoke is plugged in. You know, it's like you just you start hearing music play out of your Jason JJ Cruza phone for the first time. And then all of a sudden you're like, whoa, like, to no, no, geez, this thing, how many mistakes did I make? Okay, this one is good too. What the hell? Well, I pulled the rest of the transistors out, the driver and the oscillator, and they're good. And I'm checking the pots now just because they're sticking out and it's likely they could get hurt. And I'm turning the vertical centering pot, I'm on the center tap, and it appears it's not working. It's just staying right at 15 volts the whole time. And I don't know if this would completely kill the vertical deflection, but this pot is not good. The vertical size is uh, I guess I should check vertical hold. Okay, vertical hold is working. Vertical centering, I'm sorry, is not. So it is hurt. Okay, I took the vertical centering pot out of the set that I took the flyback out of. Let's see if there's any difference here. I am one of these times I'm going to turn it on and it's going to work. And it's not this time. The collector of the oscillator transistor is 6.7 volts. Says it's supposed to be uh, 0.86. Is that transistor not conducting? Yeah, I'm going to suggest that the... the uh, Vertical oscillator transistor is no longer a transistor. According to this, it's uh, two diodes in a, a 0.7 ohm resistor. Very interesting. I wonder how that died. Okay, the vertical oscillator transistor has been replaced. Uh, I just took it out of our donor set, our flyback donor set. Is this the time we turn it on and it works? Sort of. Hey, look at that. So just these pots. Yeah, I don't want this board to fall and short out anymore. Here's our resistor that was turning red. And here's a new one. This one's measuring 29 ohms. The new one is measuring 38 ohms. So it did, the resistance did go down a little bit, making it glow red. But imagine if that was a carbon resistor. Horizontal's way off, isn't it? I don't even like turning this damn thing. This is where you could... Wow. Okay.
Do we have a horizontal centering? I think we do. That's pin cushion. Horizontal centering. Okay. Uh, let's go to cross hatch. Okay, cross hatch. So I guess we got some. These are our uh, fine tuning. What this is. Yeah, I noticed this generator is kind of giving up the ghost when it comes to the uh, vertical lines. Let me go get the the other generator. Yeah, this is the leader generator. That generator is giving up the... So, yeah, we need to adjust our uh, static convergence here, which is this down here in the, the high voltage. It's this one right here. So, let's see. There we go. Wow, look at that. Holy crap, it took a long time to get to that. Let's go to color. Okay, we ain't having no color. Uh, where's color here? Let's first try turning this. Oh, there we go. There we go, we got color now. Let's see color. Of course it's blanking. Where is, where is green? So it looks like we need to shift. Uh, I can get the green over on this side, but I can't bring it over on this side. So we need to shift. I'm all the way at one end. Set hue control, which is a tent, to the mechanical center, which is all the way at one side right now, and adjust the centering control VR302 for correct skin tones, correct color bar generator, the antenna, and tune the color bar pattern, connect scope, and adjust TO3 for minimum. I want to just adjust this 352 to center it out. So here it is right here, hue. Well, I got it to where I got the green over here, but I'm still, uh, I'm still maxed out. Uh, I wonder if there's another adjustment to bring it further over. I tell you, that tip 50 is running hot. It almost burn. It burns me through the gloves, which are not. I mean, it's hot. This heat sink is hot. I don't think this package conducts as much heat as the bigger. And this is. This is pretty hot too. It's, it's hot. Maybe I should get that other TV and see how it... If it runs this hot. That thing is cooking. I am going to change the mic away for under the regulator transistor to one of these silicone pads. Yeah, the problem here is the transistor is not sitting flush. This is not going to work. Yeah, I got sick of this crap. Um, I just took the whole thing out of the other TV. This is hilarious. Let's go over what it took to get this TV working, all because this flyback is screwed up. So, here's what we got. We sacrificed three regulator transistors, three SCRs, we had, well, we sacrificed basically two horizontal drivers, we had a bad horizontal oscillator transistor, we blew the fuse, we preemptively changed the damper diode, uh, three resistors, 
actually four resistors and this was a capacitor I changed because it looked like it was leaking. So these are all the parts right here it took to get this set working. Still think you can just ask a question in a form or a page or a group or an email and get the answer to fix your vintage television? We also had the elusive Zener diode. I don't know where that went. It's really hard on this thing. I wish it would... But the regulator transistor is really hot. Look at that. 130 degrees on the regulator transistor. And a lot of these are reflections because... Man, there's a lot of hot parts on this board. Jeez, look at that horizontal centering pot. Keep cranking this damn thing up. It likes to keep recalibrating. Something on the flyback here that's... Oh, those resistors on the flyback are pretty hot. Wow, that horizontal centering pot is really hot. I'm going to look at the other TV. Yeah, this one's almost exactly the same thing. See how hot this regulator transistor is. 133, it's the same. About this high volt, the flyback, it's the same thing. Okay, I'm just doing all my checks here. We want to make sure nothing's out of line between the two TVs. There's one more thing I want to check here um, that is akin to cathode current on a tube set. We're in amp mode, which is cathode current on this. It says 820 milliamps. I hope I don't blow it up doing this. We are at 790 milliamps. Let's let it warm up. Wow. Right on 820 milliamps. Right on it. I'd love to see it lower, but I'm not going to worry about it. I'm just on the rabbit ears here. I moved the tape to the top. I'm just got channel six going. And yes, 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 I know channel six will be going away here in a few months, but might as well use it while it's here. Not that. I really understand what's going on with it, but okay. So who actually made it this far into the video? Entonces, entró también el otro discípulo, el que había llegado primero al sepulcro, y vio y crió. Porque hasta entonces no habían entendido las escrituras según las cuales Jesús resucitar de entre los muertos.
Come on. Palabra del Señor. Gloria a ti, Señor Jesús. K-Jazz. I don't know what this thing is with the color cycling like that. It's kind of odd. There we go. Had to pull the antenna out. Well, if I touch the antenna... Anyway, let's go to the um, generator. Okay. Look at that. It's like too damn bright for the camera. Wow, this thing has a good picture. Wow. like so damn bright it's so bright the camera starts blanking it that's a trip it's like there it's like the red is up a little bit too high oh well I already put it back together. There's green, blue, red. Okay, let's hook it to the digital converter box. Oh, crank the gain up, crank the audio gain all the way up. mà được phát triển và có đầy đủ dưỡng chất ở bên trà, trong cái cụ sâm. Vâng thưa quý vị, ở đây Hi, Phil Swift here for Flex Pace. The incredible rubberized Flex paste. paste. Right out of the tub, Flex Paste is super thick. It clings to the surface and It instantly fills gaps and holes. Let's Pace penetrates deep into hard to reach areas. You can spread it, shape it, to take on just about any form. Use Flex Paste on wood, metal, all types of surfaces. And once it dries, it turns to this, a strong, flexible rubber. It expands and contracts. Flex Paste is- So it's like roofing tar. a lot of damage but with flex paste you can create a watertight seal flex paste rubberized coating is uv chemical and mildew resistant oh. in extreme heat driving rain or freezing cold flex paste keeps its hold flex paste is perfect for projects 
crafts, and hobbies. Shape it, mold it, or paint it any color. With Flex Paste, you can create just about anything you can imagine. And when insects or rodents are getting into your home, use Flex Paste to seal up large holes to keep those unwanted pests out. Uh oh. Flex Paste Advanced Formula won't dissolve or wash away. Oh no. And it even works underwater. So you can apply Flex Paste underwater. And it even dries underwater. And once Flex Paste dries, it turns into a strong, flexible rubber. Storms and floods can destroy your home, but you can push Flex Paste deep into wet surfaces and hard to reach areas. Now it's easy to seal up windows and doors to help prevent flood damage. To show you the power of Flex Paste, I took this chicken wire. Woo! Bent, shaped, and molded it, then covered it with only flex paste and created the world's first flex paste rubber boat. Not only does flex paste seal up every hole in the chicken wire, but it creates a strong watertight barrier. It's like lath and plaster, right? And the inside BFD. is completely dry. <laughs> <laughs> you can get Flex Paste and the entire Flex Seal family of products at FlexSealProducts.com. Guys, as we get older, we all lose testosterone. The Force Factors Cast X 180 works to boost it back, build muscle, increase energy, fuel desire, and improve performance. Rush to Walmart. Flex Paste.